Uh, Jason, thank you so much for uh, being willing to have this conversation. Uh, I know you work with a lot of churches and um, mm -hmm. in a lot of the groups, we're seeing people asking questions about, um, you know, how can my church communicate about this right now? What should we say? What shouldn't we say? And uh, I know that you've been at the, at least in, in my social media, I've seen a lot of your comments and, and very uh, clear perspective on what's going on. And because mm -hmm. you're in church world, I really wanted to have this conversation. Um, let's yeah. just dive right in. Let's uh, take this thing head on. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously, let's start with why is it important to communicate? I know a lot of churches have seen um, a lot of the issues that have been coming up uh, and maybe you can give better words to this. I know I'm fumbling over my words, but, um, you know, the racial injustice and inequality and, uh, you know, clear racism. A lot of churches are struggling because it's become a very political issue and yeah. they want to stay politically neutral because they probably who have people uh, who attend their church who on, on both sides of the aisles. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they want to stay politically neutral, which means sometimes we opt to be silent in a situation that could be considered political. Why is it a concern that we might be silent and why is it important that we do speak up and say something? I think at this point in the game and I mean, the, this what are we in June 2020 and 2020 has been quite a year. Uh, it's it's almost seen as um, silence is, is being seen as uh, being complicit in the, the injustices that are going on. Now, in the United States <clears throat> and um, everything uh, or a lot of things, especially political, is very divisive right now. Depending on who you are, you can say it started with the current administration. Some people say it started with the previous administration. Either way, here we are. Right. So when you look at, you take that and then you take looking at the data of how certain um, just groups voted politically, whether it be, uh, you know, um, evangelicals being a group and how they voted or um, other groups or African-American and, and, and their church groups and how they voted. There's lines of division in terms of how they voted, issues they vote on and so on and so forth. So now we're having churches, which again, before all this started, church Sunday was already looked at as the most segregated day in the nation because people were going into churches, churches were segregated. The history of church and it being a segregated environment is not, is, is not a secret. Like church, the history of churches, the history of some of these denominations has a lot of racism in it all the way back to, uh, if you look at it, some people feel like uh, a lot of Christianity was introduced to African-Americans during slavery. So you have to you, what I'm well, the reason I'm mentioning all this is you have to look at uh, the miseducation and the stuff that we talk stuff we've been told going all the way back in history. And, 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 and no one even addressing that to getting to the point we are now where any issue that comes up and arises, we view it through a whole bunch of different lenses. So now you have a pastor that might be a pastor of an, of an all white church and not knowing how to address racial issues because uh, he feels like if he addresses something, he'll step on a landmine and lose all of his congregation. You have an integrated, a pastor of an integrated church who doesn't know how to address things because half the church will agree with them, half the church won't. And you have uh, pastors of, you know, of, Af of African-American churches who are addressing things and starting to speak out on things. And then you uh, and they start to get questioned from um, white people as far as, well, which Jesus are you preaching about? Because that's not the Jesus that I think. And that's not the way I view things. And then white pastors are not saying certain things are there on the other side of the political spectrum, again, totally divisive. Everything's divisive. And then there's like, well, what Jesus are you talking about? Because that Jesus doesn't seem to, to align with the Jesus that I'm thinking about. And so everything's so divided right now that, but um, that just saying nothing and being neutral, we no longer have the opportunity to do that. So we can talk about solutions later on, 
But just to address the issue of what you're talking about, you cannot be silent anymore because we have too many, too much evidence of racial injustice and social injustice. And then um, the church claims it's supposed to provide either build up people to enable themselves to provide solutions or the church is supposed to provide solutions for a lot of society's ills. But racism seems to be one that the church just tries to skirt around or hope it'll go away or here's a good one. Pray it away. No, it's not going to work like that. So uh, I know that you just had a really incredible conversation with Neil Smith. And so I would recommend that uh, everyone after Jason and I are finished, you go watch this conversation with Neil Smith and Jason, because they've really dug into a lot of the issues Um, specifically on perspective, specifically on culture, uh, specifically on some of the arguments for and against or that strengthen what's going on and that people don't really, you know, the filters people put up that they don't really see what's going on. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I would highly recommend that conversation with Jason and Neil Smith. And what I really want to dig into in this conversation is helping the churches that are watching kind of navigate or figure out uh, how to communicate in their community during this time. Um, you, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to trip over all my words. This, this, <laughs> this really isn't like me. And, and I'm sorry. I, it is what it is. Uh, you know, we're up in Canada. And uh, right now we spend about half the year you know, in the States. And, uh, it, it seems like a different perspective up here. And Mm -hmm. yet I just read a news story where there was a mistaken identity and two police officers, um, brutally manhandled a 16 year old teenager, um, who was black. And it's, it's not, uh, unfortunately, no one's immune to it. Uh, And, and there's, there's no, unfortunately there's no, place where we can just say that's not an issue here. So what I really want to talk through is how as churches we can communicate to the community because I know it's important to not stay silent right now. And also Mm -hmm. it's important to not put our foot in our mouth and make the situation worse. Uh, You know, do, do these two ditches on the road is, is there one that's better to default to? Like, is it better to try your best and say something and, and find out you said something wrong? Is it better to stay silent? I mean, I, I get that the best situation is to be really clear. And uh, wh- where are we on that, Jason? I think what I saw this past weekend was a lot of um, pastors were having conversations, whether it be um, – uh, you saw like a Stephen Furtick having a conversation with a John Gray or um, I believe, uh, you know, uh, Bishop Jakes had a conversation. Um, I think he had a, I can't think of the white pastor he was talking I think it's about. Judas Smith. Judas Smith. OK, so we're seeing. I could be wrong on um, that. You know, no, I think it's Carl Lentz, actually. I'm, I'm sorry. Was I Carl Lentz? Oh, yes, yes. I, think yes. It I was follow Carl Lentz. Lentz on Instagram. You're right. I do follow Carl Lentz on Instagram. So we're seeing white pastors and black pastors have these conversations. So that is, uh, so, so to answer your question, staying silent, no, no, that's not it. That's not going to work. So that, that, let's, let's just remove that off the table of staying silent. And the reason you can't stay silent is because America at this particular time has not even acknowledged the issue of racism or hoped or thought that it went away that we saw that white America, and, um, and I'm not going to make everybody a monolith, but white America is the majority in terms of population and numbers. So when I got to default to data, I'll go to that while we're having our conversation. White America is the largest population here in the United States, okay? So the majority of them had, didn't see racism as an issue or as as bad as an issue. So therefore to them, the American dream was working. Everything was fine. And so, but we're starting to see that there were minorities, black people being 12 to 14 percent of the population, even uh, and, and brown people, um, you know, uh, I forget what the what the numbers is on their uh, their part of the population. But there was if you have a conversation with them, you saw that racism was an issue. So we did have two different Americas. And so when you're having um, white churches have conversations about their life experience and their American experiences and their spiritual experiences. And then black and brown churches having conversations about their 
spiritual experiences and life experiences, so on and so forth, they're, they're, they're so vastly different that you're, you would see a division in religion. The spiritual experiences was, was divided. And so that, and in that, the church who was supposed to have this solution and, and the, this, this spiritual solution for these ills was becoming divided. And then, and that's before we even got to, uh, uh, what was the term I heard? Um, I want to call it Christian nationalism, American nationalism, but it was the using of politics and religion, uh, um, in, especially in America and, and with the divisiveness that we have now. And so you start tying that stuff together and it became a powder keg. And so therefore, that's how a lot of reasons we got to the way we got now. So now, how do we resolve that? We have to have those start with conversations across the aisle, which we saw this past weekend. But again, in my conversation previously with Nils, I kept saying that, you know, the history um, or the people who are trying to help allies, as I call them, uh, needed to listen, learn, and then use your platform to speak up against the injustices that you're seeing. But if you're not seeing injustices, then go again, listen. Listen to people who don't who don't look like you, um, who have different life experiences than you, who are more melanated than you, um, and then learn about some of the history of. And we'll stick to the church for this conversation, but learn the history of the church and the races that has been in, within the church uh, for years. Um, learn the reason why we have white and black churches, because you know when black people were trying to go to white churches, they were made to sit in the back if they could even get in, um, learn about uh, uh, the history of uh, politics in this country and the history of certain aspects of this country and certain things. Don't default to um, MLK quotes and use the quotes that you like about MLK because MLK was a pastor and he was uh, nonviolent. And then you don't want to talk about the other stuff about him saying, Silence is, um, you know, is an issue. White moderate silence is an issue as well. You know, you don't want to talk about that part. So, you know, just you just got to you got to um, learn, listen, educate and inform yourselves. And that's what I hope we can do in this conversation as opposed to try and make it a divisive conversation. No, no, no. Let's educate and inform and talk a little bit. And that's that. That was the focus of what me and Nils were doing previously. Yeah, and and I really appreciate. It. I got really excited when I saw you and Nils up a little bit earlier this morning, mm-hmm. and the fact that you would do two lives back to back is. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> thankful for that, and I'm thankful that I got a, a slice of your schedule today to to help churches. I, I was working with a pastor recently, and uh, yeah. someone in his congregation uh, was upset that he hadn't posted anything yet. Uh, mm-hmm. about everything going on. And then when he posted something, right. somebody else in his congregation sent him a message and said, we don't need a, a white savior. We're going to stand up for yep. ourselves. Yep. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I get there's going to be people <laughs> on both sides, but how, I help me, Jason, please. Like, honestly, I faced yeah. it myself. Yeah. I, I didn't post a black square uh, on Tuesday um, because, mm-hmm. because I, I don't even know why, but I, I just feel like, you know, you're, you're in trouble if you do, and you're in trouble if you don't. So can, can you help us navigate that a little? Yeah, absolutely. So the, 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 I have black friends and I've seen them post where they said, um, whether it's, uh, well, white coworker, white friend, maybe they heard from him recently, maybe they haven't heard from him, reached out and asked, hey, are you okay with it going on? How can I help or anything? And they didn't want to listen. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't want to respond. It's like, I don't, I, I didn't, didn't need to hear from you. Um, it's not my job to educate you. You've been miseducated for years and you didn't care. And now all of a sudden you see America burning and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe America's like this. And we've been telling you America's been like this. Okay. So, when you're looking at that, the response of that is is accurate, valid, and if that person, that black person, doesn't want to um, speak to you or doesn't want you to step into this space, that is their feelings are valid. However, we need your solidarity. We need allies. We need you to stand with us. So, in me talking with you, me talking with Niels, and me talking with 
um, other church communicators that are white, you know, uh, me having a conversation with Seth and the great article he wrote, Dear White People, on his website, sethmuse.com, like those, there are people, Black people who are um, open to educating you, helping you understand, listen, learn that, you know, there are some things that we do need allies. If, if we go back to the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement was not just a whole bunch of black people, uh, you know, talking about we, will, we shall overcome. They had allies. They had white people that had to help. In America especially, um, and I'm only speaking of America because I'm not really familiar with Canada, so I'm going to focus on America. Um, in America especially, just a numbers game. If we're only 12% of the population, we need white allies to help us out. And what I've been seeing uh, when I've stepped into conversations, uh, especially one of my friends yesterday who said, you know, he heard the same thing that the pastor heard. Uh, uh, you know, one of his black friends was like, we, you know, we don't want to hear from you. We don't want to hear your voice. And I told him, hey, we need your voice. We need your voice. We need you to speak up. So there will be people that are frustrated and hurt and rightfully so. And they may not want to hear your voice, but we need your voice. We need you to stand in solidarity. We need you to to speak on these issues and injustices that you're seeing. And even if you're just posting on Facebook and are, and you have to go back and forth with your white friends in comments who don't understand or are not seeing things the way you see them, that is a start. Because, because now, instead of being quiet and just letting your friends, and I won't say your friends, you know, your white friends are racist, but they're just, mis they're, they're misunderstood. Some of them are just racist. They are what they are but they, they don't understand certain things. They'll listen to you and argue with you. They'll interact with you. If I come on that post, they're not trying to hear me because they, they don't want to hear what I have to say. They're not interested in what I have to say. They don't care about my opinion, but they'll at least listen to you. And that's why your voice as a white ally is so important. That's why that pastor's voice as a white ally is so important. We do need him to speak up. If you had decided, you decided yesterday, hey, I'm not posting um, the blackout um, uh, square for yesterday. The other parts of Blackout Tuesday was not was in addition to the Black Square, find another way to either educate yourself, use your platform, or speak out against this. Me and you are talking today. So therefore, you're doing your part. And there, are, there obviously is more that you can do, but again, you're doing this today. So you're, this message and me and you having this conversation may reach more people than your Black Square would have mentioned, but it's definitely gonna educate and inform them way more than you just putting up a Black Square. So you gotta play your part in this in this particular movement that's happening and a black square may not have been your part adam that's fine so i know that a lot of churches are they want to say something but they're concerned they're going to say the wrong things yeah um so let's just tackle some pretty major hurdles and why they're the wrong things <laughs> so the response to black lives matter is sometimes all lives matter and i think yeah. that you know from a from a factual perspective, I agree that all lives matter. But yes. as a rhetorical response to Black Lives Matter, then yeah. now it becomes a tagline, like a pushback, like an argumentative place. Yeah. You know, uh, before Black Lives Matter was an important slogan, if somebody said to me, do all lives matter? Of course, my answer is yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. But now it becomes... Uh, a pushback. So let's just tackle that one head on. Oh, absolutely. So when we look at All Lives Matter, yeah, the All Lives Matter crowd didn't even come along until uh, Black Lives Matter started. And so when, and so therefore it became a, a typical in the U.S. Um, divisive because uh, the people who felt convicted by Black Lives Matter felt like it was offensive to them or you're calling me right. racist, uh, whether it be white fragility or, you know, or, or white guilt, whatever it was, they immediately was like, you know, well, I, black lives matter, but all lives have to matter because I'm not racist. And so that, then we're like, that's not what we're talking about. We're basically saying there's, if, if we have five houses on a block, one's white, one's black, one's yellow, one's red, you know, and one's brown, and the black one's on the fire and then when the fire department comes we're gonna say hey that black house is on fire that black house matters put the put the fire out of the black house and we don't want a group of people running out of the white house saying whoa whoa all houses matter 
So focus on all the houses. All the houses are not on fire. The black house is on fire. The black house is being filmed on fire. The people who put the black house on a fire are being filmed and not being held accountable for putting that house on fire. We really would appreciate it if you put the fire out on the black house. So now that's that's what we were getting at in terms of the injustices of Black Lives Matter. But we had to get at the point of people feeling um, guilty, convicted, and so on, and trying to appropriate the Black Lives Matter movement and turn it into something that it was, was not, which was that we are not trying to say other lives don't matter. Right. So, and we're saying that the Black lives do matter. And that, that was the goal. And, and that became, again, very typical. It became a divisive. And so we couldn't even get past that. And, and, and Black people had spent so much time having to prove justice and prove different things going on that we had to start filming it for people to even believe that these injustices were happening. And now we finally started filming it and there still wasn't any accountability. And we started saying Black Lives Matter. And then we had to prove that we were talking about Black Lives Matter. But um, yeah, so we had to prove that, you know, Black Lives Matter and we had to prove all these different things were happening. And we had to prove that, you know, we're not trying to say that your life doesn't matter. And it's been a continuous plight of Black people in the United States. We have to prove that our humanity over and over and over again. And so therefore, you know, it's just, it's, it's unfortunate. And now um, when we tried the peaceful protest, of, you know, Kaepernick kneeling or kneeling the national anthem, then we had to prove it wasn't about we're trying to disrespect the veterans. And so, and that became divisive. These things are actually what we're saying they are. Now people are starting to, to believe us based on, instead of, uh, you know, because now they escalated to the point where we're like, oh my God, there's a problem. Yeah, we've been saying it for years. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, when, when Black Lives Matter started, um, I lived in Florida at the time and, uh, I was honored to be part of a multicultural church. And we had people from all over the world who were very active and, and part of our church. And, and that was uh, a really cool experience for us. Um, yeah. and so, but one of the things that a, a fish, uh, initially, I shouldn't say officially initially came out um, with the Black Lives Matter was a response that Blue Lives Matter, you know, obviously referring to police officers. And there was this, I think, unfair conversation about people saying that Black Lives Matter meant that police lives didn't matter. And uh, yeah. I think we can agree that police lives matter because there are plenty yeah. of uh, responsible police officers who are doing their job. And I, I would hope that's the vast majority. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. it's not a hundred percent. And, um, so how do we, when, when people say blue lives matter in response to black lives matter, or as part of, you know, their social media strategy, maybe one day they're saying black lives matter and they're honoring, uh, African Americans in their community, and then the next day they say "Blue Lives Matter." Uh, again, can you just help me understand why that's taking away the focus on what Black Lives Matter uh, and and the justice that needs to happen? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that when you look at Blue Lives Matter, um, we we're not saying that blue lives don't matter, and we're not we're definitely not saying go out and kill cops. What we're saying is, uh, you know. Black, Blue Lives Matter to me is a response to Black Lives Matter as if somehow cops, you know, we're saying, you know, the cops are, are, all, are all bad. We're not saying the cops are all bad. We're saying that if you have 100 good cops and five bad cops and 100 good cops don't say anything, you have 105 bad cops. So the example that we were using, uh, that I've been using is, uh, you know, if I had, if you have 100 pilots and you have um, five of those pilots that continue to fly the planes into mountains, it's like you have a, you have a flight, pl flight, pro flight problem. You have a pilot problem. And so you don't, if those pilots seem to see that only when certain people get on the planes, they decide they want to fly the planes in the, into mountains, 
then you're going to you're going to revamp the airline industry and you're going to look at and if we have video of these pilots flying these planes into mountains they're going to they're going to revamp the industry and they're going to look at all the pilots and start to uh you know disassociate themselves from the pilots that keep killing people same thing if we have doctors there are certain professions that if you keep kill um people you know innocent people then there are problems there and so with uh black people we our view and our bringing up of the cops especially with the fact that we've been taught that cops came from police originally from the beginning started from slave catchers we've been taught that so if you're taught that that's what the cops were generation to generation to generation now you get down to my generation where we have to have i my parents had to sit down and have a uh, talk with me about how to deal with the police then and um you know my friends and families who have black sons have to have conversations of how to deal with the police then it's not the same conversations that you would have to have with you know with your children about how to deal with the police then it's like th- there's a problem there and we know that the 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 majority of cops are good we just want them to say something about the bad but we know there's a blue wall of silence and we know that there's um uh immunity for the cops, uh, I can't think of the term. Um, it's an immunity that cops have, you know, where they're they're not held responsible for yeah. their actions while on the job, based on that. And then the cops are policing themselves. So if the cops think they're innocent when they did something, then, it, then it's done. It's like there's no accountability, responsibility, even with us filming these things. And so we and we can now understand, hopefully, that even looking at video, taking out the uh, account the fact of people who say, "Well, what happened before and after the video?" No, we watched them for mi- like eight minutes kill somebody. We watched them shoot them on video. Doesn't matter what they were doing before, or after, whatever they did, it wasn't a death sentence, and the cop who shot them was not the judge and executioner. But you have people, you know, a certain demographic of people who've been taught that the cops are innocent until proven guilty, not the actual victims. And so therefore in our system, our American system is supposed to be equal and innocent until proven guilty, but we know it's not. It wasn't built like that. From the foundation of it, it was built that it, white people were better than black people and black people were three fifths of a person. It was in the initial foundational parts of this country. So when we're looking at that. My The experience I had when I was told how to deal with cops was be respectful. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Keep your hands visible. If the cops get behind you while you're driving, you know, uh, you, 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 don't, you, they say go find somewhere lit and, and do that. But if I go drive too far with the cops behind me, then I'm evading arrest and I'm getting shot at. That's what happens. So pull over and you hope for the best. But, you know, it's just a different experience. And so, and um, there's only so many times that you're going to let um, black people, especially me being a black man, there's only so many videos I can watch that are traumatizing to the point where I don't want to watch the videos anymore. And I start to understand how, how can I not look at it and say one day, that's not going to be a situation where I get pulled over for something random as running a stop sign and cops got me uh, pulled, pushed out, you know, in my, in my front yard with guns on me talking, cause I tried to drive to somewhere that was uh, more safe to pull over. And they pulled me, they, you know, and they pulled guns on me like, uh, for running a stop sign like they did the kid in Midland, Texas. Like that stuff really happens. There are examples of each of these things that we just and and when it's a white person on video, we see that even if they have weapons, AR-15 storming the Capitol, have knives or whatever, cops get these mysteriously magical de-escalation powers to be able to defuse the situation. And some of those we just want those same um, de-escalation. Uh, um, outcomes, and we don't get that. So therefore, you know, there's not a way to just stay silent about stuff that we're seeing on video. It's not hearsay anymore. It's video, and we're actually seeing it. Yeah. And so that's what's making this, 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 um, and, and it continues to be divisive because now you're having people look at, they're having their whole reality question, their whole education question, their whole upbringing, their whole American view, um, view um, question and don't want to say America's broken. That's what it is. Okay. So, um, sorry, had a moment. (laughs) Um, I just can't imagine. Sorry. 
Yeah. So it's 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 tough, brother. So when one of the things I could say in continuing in this is it's conversations like this are so important because the people that you reach that don't that won't listen to me uh, need to hear that you're aware and you're open to speaking about these um, injustices, no matter the consequences, because there are people that. You know, uh, even when Seth wrote his article, he told me he lost subscribers from that. But it was quite pot. Overall, the majority of it was positive responses to him writing an article called Dear White People. The um, conversations that you're having, you know, about this and giving me a platform to speak on, on your, uh, uh, you know, on the platform you've built about these issues and, and tell churches on how they can respond to this um, definitely helps. When we were talking about earlier, um, what can white pastors do? What can multicultural pastors do? And what can black pastors do? Even addressing that. White pastors, if you're if you're a white pastor and you have an all white church and you have people that are on both sides of the spectrum, your best bet to do <clears throat> is if you, you tell people, hey, try and if I use the aspect of listen, um, it would be great for the pastor initially because people look to him for, you know, information, education, inspiration, et cetera, to try and listen and learn and educate himself on some of the uh, injustices and atrocities that are going on. If you don't have a black friend, then find a resource. One of the resources that you can put out with this that I put out is ichurchmethod.com slash BLM resources. So ichurchmethod.com slash BLM resources. That is a link to a Google doc that has a whole bunch of resources that can educate you about um, things that are going on these days. If that pastor educates himself and then is able to speak from his perspective to the audience about um, the congregation, about some of the injustices, but frame it in a way that um, is not, you know, using uh, you get more bees with honey, you know, than vinegar. Frame it in a way that they can understand it because you don't have to beat them over the head with it. It's all about presentation. If you can frame it in a way that they can understand it, then you can start to get them to slowly, you know, um, change their view of what they think America is and maybe help them understand a little bit. I have a friend who I've done podcasts with who um, I didn't know till, till this week that he didn't understand the Kaepernick uh, kneeling situation. He didn't understand it. And he was adamantly against it. And so, but he said, now he gets it. So, okay, great. Now that you get it, now you can speak on it from a different perspective and that's fine. But it wasn't, I didn't feel the need to be like, see, I told you so. I told you, you weren't been listening. No, no, no. We have to move forward from here. Okay. So now when something else comes up in the future, instead of rushing the judgment, because what he doesn't understand, he'll, reach out and ask like, hey, what's your perspective on this, Jason? You know, because I don't quite understand this issue and your experiences are different. That's how I think a white pastor can help when he learns and educates himself. Integrated pastor who has, uh, you know, a multicultural church, I believe that the, it, in his aspect or in his um, approach to it, he has the resources to have a conversation with someone in his congregation who could be respected um, and 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 appreciated? Their voice can that can help articulate some of the injustices from the black perspective, from the brown perspective. He has those resources within his congregation, so that they can he can he can talk to uh, or give them a platform to speak from the stage. Um, you know, the same way Stephen Furtick and John Gray did. You know, or he can have a conversation and bring in a prominent black pastor if he's a white pastor who runs it, or a black pastor can bring in a prominent white pastor. And they can have a conversation from both sides of, of the aisle of perspective of what an experience is like here in America for a white person versus a black person. We to understand we know they're different. We know they're different. And once we identify the issues and the plans and, and, and undo the miseducation that has occurred for a lot of white people about what America has been and has stood for and how they selectively choose to use wording for, um, you know, if it's America trying to get liberty and pursuit of justice and break away, then that's, that's fine from tyranny, then that's fine for it to get its independence. But if somebody's trying to 
you know, has a problem with America, then all of a sudden, you know, they're they're uh, going against the government and they're, you know, SOBs and all the rest of this stuff with the divisive words coming from our leadership. So it's just it's just you have to use the the, the resources and have conversations and find the common ground um, of, of where we can start the conversation and then go from there of listen, learn and then uh, everybody, everybody speak up. But don't speak up in ignorance. We have to listen and learn first. So um, one of the things that I'm thankful about is that this is actually a conversation, uh, not just you and I, but that we are actually having these conversations. Um, There are churches who uh, are part of minorities who may not be at the forefront of the conversation right now. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the pastors or to the communications directors of those churches about how they can voice concerns that they also have um, and and how to be part of the community uh, and do it in a way that um, doesn't diminish their problem, but also wants to elevate and encourage their people to become part of the solution, if that's even a possibility. So like what, what what type of church would you mean for an example? Well, I know that, um, you know, there's been some Asian churches where people have chosen not to participate because of the oh. coronavirus, um, mm-hmm. where people won't a- accept um, food from their food pantry um, mm-hmm. or, you know, how, how can how can other churches who are also experiencing similar things but may not have as much of a voice right now? How can they communicate right now with their community? I think that, um, for example, with Asian churches um, and the discrimination they received, especially with the coronavirus, um, uh, I think that right now, if, if they, if the hot button topic right now is, is um, black lives matter and, and, and black social injustices, then I think it would be beneficial for them to come alongside uh, that movement and show their um, show that they're an ally in that movement, but have a plan to be able to expand the conversation to racism as a whole and not just black racism, because there are more than just white and black people in America. Right. Um, the 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 Asians, Asian racism and what they had to deal with when coronavirus took off um, was just a minor blip on a media radar. And it wasn't really addressed the way it's been addressed because our news cycle uh, happened so quick. There's so much nonsense that that could have been a Tuesday 10 a.m. you know, headline. And by Tuesday at 12 p.m., there was something else that had overtaken that already, right. whether it be something that came from our leadership that was incredibly unsmart that was said or an actual issue you know, they're related to a a black person or something like that. So that would be my, my thought process, um, especially if we were in an, an, uh, an Asian country and we were a black church and there was a Asian uh, discrimination issue, I would say we'll show alliance with that issue. And then we'll try and expand on that later on and talk about, Hey, there's still racism that we're dealing with as well, especially with, um, you know, the, with uh, brown people as well. There's there's race, racism that they're dealing with. The the interesting thing about I've seen in, in America and the media is an interesting um, uh, double-edged sword, especially with the control that social media has. Um, the divisiveness between minority groups, whether it be Asians and Blacks or Black and Brown or Asian and Brown or what have you, um, is an issue in itself. And we don't, we, we don't even have to get into that at the moment, but if you keep the minorities divided where they can't even come together to address uh, a white supremacist system, then uh, you know that, that is a losing battle also. So again, it's good that we have white allies that are coming alongside this uh, black issue, but we do know that we have Asian brothers and, and, and brown and Latino brothers and sisters that we need to, that have issues that we need to address as well. It's just at this particular time, Asian issues and not nearly as many brown issues are being filmed 
where um, they are being murdered and the perpetrators are walking away for free. Right. Um, talk to me a little bit about, so a church figures out exactly how they want to uh, support and um, speak up against racial injustice. And then they post something on their social media channels and inevitably mm-hmm. somebody shows up with something inappropriate or it just countervalent or just not, not in line with where the church is trying to help. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how you, how you would recommend a church uh, deals with those comments. Obviously there's a variety of spectrums from, you know, somebody who mildly disagrees to somebody who's belligerent. And so talk to me a little bit about how the church communications person, whoever is running social media can, can, do, do do we try to engage with some of those? Do we try and ban some of those? And and what do we do in the middle ground? Um, I think that the social media person at this particular point, uh, with them representing the entire organization and how quickly their comments can turn into uh, powder kegs, needs to be in tune with leadership on how they want to address certain issues. If you empower that person to address certain responses, then that person needs to be educated enough to be able to address it in a manner that's not, um, that's not, that doesn't come off as uh, um, offensive and understand that if you're going to engage with someone on social media, uh, it's very difficult at times to change the opinion of someone in comments especially Twitter and Facebook. It's very hard to change someone's opinion. That's one of the worst places to argue. However, if you're exchanging information, data, facts to back stuff up, then that might work. However, we, we're even in a, a society now where if you give data from CNN and I give data from Fox News, we question the source. Mm. So we don't even believe the data. So it's you. You have to uh, the person whoever's running the church, the social media, or the church, the communications for uh, the church has to be able to, to understand each particular comment and if it's worth engaging and to keep the conversation moving forward. If you have a, a person who's actually inquisitive, uh, which you know, just hey, they're responding a certain way, and maybe they're not wording it correctly, but they're actually inquisitive and trying to learn, then don't shut them down try and educate them. If you know it's a troll, then you know it's, they're just trolling. Right. You know what it is. However, um, the, the thing that I've seen that, hap- that happens a lot, uh, especially on, um, on Twitter and Facebook, is someone asks a question and they have to preface it with, I'm not trying to be um, confrontational. I'm not trying to be offensive. And then they ask their question because they genuinely don't know. They genuinely don't understand. And um, sometimes, you know, people just automatically shut them down, like, well, go research, go figure it out yourself. If they can figure it out themselves, which sometimes they can, but they really are asking you because you might have the information that they're looking for. So try and help them out if you can. But I've been in, I've been in situations where I've done both. I've decided to educate and inform and be a resource for uh you know, my white friends, my white allies who ask me questions about the black experience, about injustice, and you an educated answer. And I'll even base it in data and stats, and I'll give you historical information about it. Um, but I've also went on posts where I've had to come off as, you know, the angry black guy, because the only way for you to understand what I'm saying in this racist post that I'm on right now is for me to come at you a certain way. So however you want to do it, you know, that that's how I do it. And other times I've, you know, I've just blocked, deleted and removed myself for the sake of my own self peace. So it just depends on how you're able to do it. But if I'm representing an organization, then it's really to educate, inform, inspire, et cetera. And if I can't, I will uh, block them or hide them so that they're the only ones that see their nonsense. Jason, I'm sure we could talk for hours about this. I'm I'm sure Mm -hmm. there's there's way more to dig into. If if you would like some more information, and I would highly recommend going to find um, the conversation that Jason had with Neil Smith this morning, um, because that's 
dug way more into the issues in the culture. I know here we're really focusing on uh, the communication side for churches. Um, yeah. Jason, I, I hope we continue to have the conversation until it's no longer necessary. And, and I hope it's no longer necessary sooner than later. And, and, you know, maybe that's never, and we just keep having these conversations, but I, I don't know. Any, any last thoughts on that? <clears throat> I think that, um, I think that people, uh, you know, we need voices like yours to use your platforms to speak up on things or give um, room for people like myself who um, want to educate and, 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 and talk about these issues, a space to talk about it. I'm encouraged when I see that even though, unfortunately, our kids have seen more in 2020 and are more socially aware and consciously aware than me and you ever were as kids. Right. Um, I don't like the fact that they've had to see these things. I don't like the fact that they're so politically aware or socially aware and stuff like that. But I'm encouraged by the fact that they are because the way they view the future is vastly different than and much more optimistic than we view it. Therefore, they, they I think, can be the change that we probably won't live to see. That's fine. I'm fine with my grandchildren um, not having to deal with the issues that I had to deal with. I do recall <clears throat> thinking, what would it be like if I lived back when my grandmother um, lived during Jim Crow and what that stuff was like? Or my great grandmother, when I asked her questions about what it was like when she lived deep in Mississippi back in the 1920s and the Depression and stuff and the stories that she told me. And I was like, that is crazy. I could never imagine. And then yet here we are dealing with, uh, you know, the 2020 version of the social injustice and different issues. And I, the thing that I am very excited about that I've seen over the last uh, more, more recent times is white allies using their platforms and voices to speak up and not just uh, saying, you know, I'm not for the racism but I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to lose, you know, the platform I have, audience, clients, my livelihood and all that type of stuff, which totally, I totally get. But silence is complicitness. Silence is complicity. So we need, um, we need, you know, people to listen to what we're saying, um, learn about the, uh, the history that you've been taught and the inaccuracies of it, and then speak up. And don't let things slide from people that, you know, you may have been friends with that you would let, you know, uh, inappropriate comments or racist stuff just slide before because you're like, oh, that's just them being them. It's like, no, no, we, we, we can't let that slide because that grows into a whole entire movement. And then the, and we see in the United States, the divisiveness is it, it, it's very it, it's bad. It's bad. And so you get to the point where, you know, the country looked like it was burned. This past weekend, the country was burning everywhere. There were movements everywhere. Every state had some type of protest going on. We've never seen that. So, and the last time we got close to that was when uh, Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. So, this is a moment in time. This is a moment in history. We talk about that history, you know, it, uh, now, but our kids are going to be talking about the times we're living through now. And so, the stuff that we're doing is helping move the needle incrementally along by educating and informing audiences that me and you have about these issues and the, the things they can start to do to help. Jason, there's so much more to say, and I'm not sure there's really an, an easy way to cap this all off other than to say, let's, let's continue the conversation and thank you for what you do. If somebody wants to connect with you, I know you mentioned uh, ichurchmethod.com slash BLM resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and I posted that in the comments and uh, somebody helped me realize that it's case sensitive. So it needs to be all lowercase ichurchmethod.com slash BLM resources. So if somebody's looking for it, you can't find it. Don't click my link, click uh, Tyler's link. <laughs> Uh, and, and track it down. If somebody wants to connect with you, Jason, what's the best way for them to uh, connect with you, pick your brain, continue this conversation or hire you to help with their church? Oh, absolutely. So if it's anything that has to do with as far as with church related stuff, ichurchmethod.com, 
that's for me and, and, you know, connect with me and anybody on my team. If you're trying to talk to me, I'm, I'm in the social media space everywhere at Jason cast and Instagram, Twitter, uh, you know, what TikTok <laughs> for me and my daughters who we have to get our dance on every so often, but yeah, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Jason cast and, uh, and, and definitely, um, you know, I'm not one of those people who, <laughs> who doesn't respond. Like I actually interact in the social media space. So I, I'm a real person who talks back to people. And, um, and I've decided for, because I have such a diverse audience of friends on my Facebook page, I do actually go, you know, onto my friends posts, mainly white friends posts and educate and talk to them about stuff. You know, when I see the interactions going on where there are differences of opinions and mis misinformation. And usually I'm probably the only black guy on there that's talking and that's fine. I'm used to being in those environments, but somebody has to, um, you know, help bridge this gap because it's just a gap of miseducation, divisiveness, misunderstanding, and sometimes just plain bigotry and racism. Well, I, I know that the responsibility lies with us personally and as organizations, I hope that churches are at the forefront of bringing to light racial injustice and equality and doing something about it. And uh, I know it's not a small, small issue or uh, something we could fix overnight or else we would have. Um, but I, right. I think the conversations right. are important both as individuals and as organizations. So I thank you so much for your input here. And uh, I, I guess we have to sign off. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks everybody that took time to listen. Thanks Jason. We'll talk soon.